In motorsport, the glory of winning masks a risk that all competitors accept. You'd be kidding yourself though, if you thought that you were going to go racing where you're not going to have a crash. These crashes are extraordinary, pushing the human body to its limits, sometimes with fatal consequences. If you're having an aircraft action, you're not having a car action. It's kind of like jumping out of an intercity train, I would say, if you were trying to replicate that experience at home. Welcome to the violent world of the ultimate racing crashes. In a roadside accident, a driver will experience a force of 30G on their body. This sudden deceleration can have devastating consequences, even at low speeds. 50% of all fatal crashes have a delta V below 30 miles an hour. But in racing collisions, the G-force driver's experience is now into the hundreds. I went head on into the wall at about 210 miles an hour. And so, I mean, literally, I never lifted the throttle trace, just went like straight down. And... You know, when you're flying through the air at 130, 140 mile an hour, that's not very satisfying, you know? <laughs> you know that it's not gonna be pretty when you land. And yet today, 99 times out of 100, the racers will walk away with only minor injuries. I didn't have a headache, I didn't, have, I didn't black out, I didn't, nothing. This program examines the pivotal crashes that rocked the motorsport world and shocked the viewing public. It will investigate the accidents themselves, go on to explore the aftermath and the victim's battle for survival. From the post-war years, when the dynamics of a crash weren't understood and every season one in seven drivers lost their lives, to the latest developments which today keep racers alive. But of all the disasters, one had the most profound effect. Captured live on television, this single crash shook the racing fraternity to its very core. Its aftermath brought about sweeping alterations to racetracks across the world to slow the cars down. The San Marino Grand Prix on the 1st of May, 1994, was a black day in motor racing history. Well, Formula One had been 12 years without a fatality of any kind, and there had been no enormous name to die in Formula One for many years. There was an entire generation of Formula One drivers who had grown up and gone through the schooling formulas and into Formula One, not even considering death as a factor. The racing community almost believed that they'd managed to tame the effects of an impact, but they were wrong. This crash reminded them of the fatal nature of their business and took the life of Formula One's leading light. Ayrton Senna was one guy who could not die in a race car. He was just too good. He was the Mozart of Formula One drivers. He was meticulous. He was brilliant. Uh, he couldn't die. Senna had reached the point where he was unquestionably the man. He was the benchmark. He'd won the championship three times. At that time, Imola in northern Italy was one of the fastest tracks in Formula One, and thus one of the most exciting to race on. But that weekend started badly when Senna's fellow Brazilian Rubens Barrichello crashed during Friday's qualifying session. Senna was deeply upset by that accident, went to visit uh, Barrichello, was relieved he was OK. But there was, there's no question, that Friday evening, it, everybody had been given a little bit of a jolt here. Saturday, of course, we had um, the death of Roland Ratzenberger. The fact that Ratzenberger's crash was the result of a car failure was of little consequence. A visibly upset Senna even confessed to his girlfriend that he didn't want to race the next day. He died 24 hours later from a crash at Imola's notorious flat-out corner, Tamburello Bend. Tamburello was this sweeping left-hander, which was technically not a 
particularly difficult corner. But the problem was that it had this wall on the outside. But that's why it was so exciting. You had disaster right there. You literally were looking disaster in the face in that concrete wall. This is a reconstruction of the view from Senna's car as he approached Tamburello Bend at nearly 230 kilometers an hour. To understand why Senna may have crashed, you need to know a little about the science that keeps these cars on the road. The technology is such that cars have become quicker through corners. Straight line speed doesn't really mean an awful lot. You have a combination of tyre technology and car technology, and the two together have combined to make these phenomenal machines through corners. Formula One cars race at speeds of up to 330 kilometers an hour. The car's hold on the track is from a combination of mechanical grip generated by the suspension and aerodynamic grip from the wings. And all of that must go through the tires. A racing tire is fundamentally different to a road car tire. The surface temperature of a racing tire is, is around 150 to 200 degrees C, somewhere in that, in that window. If you were able to put your hand on the tyre and pull it away, uh, it would be coated in rubber. It's that sticky. It's like, it's all, it's all, it's approaching chewing gum. But at speeds greater than the takeoff velocity of a jet aircraft, the cohesion created by the high tyre temperature is not enough to keep the car on the road. This is where downforce comes in. The aim of downforce is to increase the force pressing the car onto the circuit, onto the tarmac, uh, and that's to increase the friction between the, the tyre and the track. Designers have discovered that accelerating the airflow under the car creates a negative pressure which sucks it into the road. The closer you bring the car to the road, the greater the downward force. But it's a risky business because if the car makes contact with the tarmac, all this downforce is suddenly lost. As Senna was about to negotiate the Tangrello Bend for the seventh time, sparks were seen coming from the rear of his car, a sure sign it was bottoming out. When the belly of the car hits, that means that the wheels are now sitting too high in relationship to the car to do you any good for, for maneuverability, for steering. In 1994, Formula One cars would often bottom out on straights with no consequence. But during cornering, it was a potentially hazardous situation. We've all had conkers on strings and swung them around our heads, and if you cut the string, the conker flies off. It's exactly the same with a racing car. If you lose adhesion or grip with the circuit, you fly off the circuit. Lap seven of the San Marino Grand Prix, Senna crashed the Tamburello Bend. One of the world's greatest racing drivers, Ayrton Senna, has died after a horrifying crash today at the San Marino Grand Prix in Italy. All of a sudden, the image of Formula One changed. It was back to a blood series worldwide. And Formula One had been like that in the 60s and early 70s, but now you were in the 1990s, an era where safety and good health and the denial of death by society as a whole. You know, we'd quit smoking, we'd gotten more fit, uh, we didn't want to have heart attacks anymore. Western society as a whole was denying death and Formula One was going along with it, that you prolonged life as long as you absolutely could. Now you have a guy in his prime, boom, gone. The shock of Senna's death was his enormous, and I went to his funeral, in fact, carried him to his last resting place. And when that accident happened, Brazil, Brazil came out in mourning. I mean, the, the roads were lined 10 deep for the, the funeral procession. The fact Ayrton Senna's death was witnessed live by millions sent shockwaves across the world. But inside the racing fraternity, people were still trying to understand how he'd been killed at all. That shouldn't have been a fatal accident because cars went off the circuit quite frequently and they're built so strongly even then that they should it should have been able to withstand the impact and he would normally have been expected to walk away from that car. He was just unlucky because the impact was such the tire was thrown back, hit him on the head and killed him. 
Formula One quickly introduced drastic new safety measures. The car's sides were built up and wheel tethers were added to keep them from reaching the drivers. At the same time, circuits across the world were altered to slow them down and Tamburello Bend would never be the same again. At every given point, no matter how safe we think we're making the sport, the danger is still there. But then that is the essential element of the sport. And people think motor racing is safe today. Well, it is until the wrong accident occurs. There's something very gladiatorial about the sport. These guys put themselves on the line every time they get into that car. No matter what, there will always be crashes, but today's drivers face a different world to those who raced in the terrifying early years. When motor racing resumed after the Second World War, Europe was shattered, but although the risks in such a devastating environment were extreme, the passion to race was all the more great because it represented freedom. The really great thing about immediate post-war racing was the sense of relief, I think, and that was best expressed to me by George Abacassis, the great British privateer of the time who founded the HWM team. And I said to him once, um, George, you know, in the late 40s, when you resumed racing on the continent, wasn't it dangerous? And he took his cigarette and its holder out of his mouth, gorgeous George, and said, good Lord, Doug, no, it wasn't dangerous at all, he said. You've got to remember, for the first time in six years, we weren't being shot at. I remember going to my father and saying, I want to be a racing driver. He, he nearly went ballistic. But to cut a long story short, he said, if you're going to race, you're going to wear a crash hat. And I can remember turning to my father and saying, Dad, that's a bit sissy. You know, the fast drivers, these people like Chiron and Sommer, and they weren't wearing crash hats, they wore these cloth helmets. We didn't wear seat belts because when you have a shunt, of course, the likelihood of fire was immense. So really, if you were lucky enough, you'd be thrown out and hope you'd land on something not too hard. But this daring mystique came to a sobering end in a horrifying accident with disastrous consequences in 1955 at Le Mans. In 1955, I was driving for Mercedes-Benz and I was teamed with Fangio. And uh, Pierre Levesque, of course, was in, in one of the Mercedes as an invitation drive because he'd done so well the year before. Pierre Levesque driving uh, a Mercedes um, crashed up and over the tail of an Austin Healey driven by Lance Macklin and the Mercedes impacted on top of the bank in front of a spectator enclosure and broke up. And the front suspension and engine of the Mercedes was thrown through the crowd like a torpedo. And the Mercedes hurled itself like a thunderbolt into an enclosure packed with spectators. It was a tragedy because so many people who were just there to see a race I mean, a driver accepts the, accepts the dangers, but for it to go and, and be the public or a marshal or something, that, that is fairly unacceptable. What was a terrible freak accident produced such a devastating death toll that it very nearly ended motorsport. The grim record that will be remembered from this race at Le Mans is of some 80 dead and more than 100 injured. Across the world, races were cancelled, and many countries, including Switzerland, have banned racing to this day. But even after this tragedy, the authorities were incapable of improving safety for the drivers. People generally look over their shoulder and see things through rose-coloured glasses, and they were the good old days. If you raced as a Formula One Grand Prix driver for a period of five years, the batting average was that there was a two out of three chance you were going to die. So they were bad years. It would take yet another big name to crash to improve safety. But Jackie Stewart's horrific experience at the 1966 Belgian Grand Prix proved that the aftermath was just as deadly as the impact. Jackie Stewart smashed broadside into the stone abutment of a barn that was there. And that bent the car in two, crushed in the top of the cockpit until the cockpit opening was only 10 inches wide. It twisted Jackie's pelvis round so that he was lying effectively on his side in the cockpit. 
And I was trapped for some 20 odd minutes in the car, semi-conscious, coming and going in and out of consciousness, um, with the electrics not being able to be switched off and me not being able to get out the car. And The fuel tanks burst and the cockpit then filled up with fuel because he was on full tanks and there was nowhere for the fuel to go. And it began to top up the cockpit. So he effectively he was laying strapped and trapped in a bath of petrol. I was taken eventually when they found an ambulance to a, what they called a medical centre, which was just concrete floor. And looking around, he told me that the first thing that struck him was that there were all these stubbed out cigarette butts on the floor around him. This was an eerily sobering experience for Stuart, in which he realised that it was imprudence, not bravery, that sent drivers to their deaths. Everybody knew the sport was dangerous. It wasn't as if suddenly we found that tiddlywinks was dangerous if you broke your nail and you get uh, some terrible infection underneath your nail. I mean, this was something that we knew we were losing lives on and we knew that cars crashed and we knew that we were sometimes catching fire. We knew all of those things, but there were no adequate protection or amenities to either suffocate fires quickly enough or get drivers out of cars or get them to hospitals properly. As a result of Stuart's tireless campaigning, by the late 70s, rapid medical response was compulsory in racing. However, the drivers were still vulnerable, and one in seven was dying on the racetrack each year. In order to prevent more fatalities, the crash needed scientific management. But it would take until the 80s for a major step forward to be passed down from a device that had been used to understand passenger car injury for over a decade. When we run a car into the barrier at the proving grounds, for the development of a passenger car for safety. We put accelerometers on the chassis and that gives us the basic, what we call crash pulse or crash signature of the structure of the car. The accelerometer acts like a black box in an aeroplane, analyzing what happens to the car's chassis as it crashes. By placing this accelerometer into the race cars, the engineers could record the real crash in microscopic increments of time. This would tell the engineers precisely when and how the crash happened and what forces injured the driver. For the first time, the racetrack had become an extension of the safety laboratory and the drivers their test pilots. The results we had were really uh, uh, quite surprising because almost 90% of the injuries, 89%, were to the uh, foot and ankles, the distal orthopedic injuries. And this, we felt, was an area that we could make a real difference. We estimated the driver's feet met the wall at 45 miles an hour. That would be like jumping off maybe a seven-story building and landing on your feet. Their ankles were shattered. The problem was is the driver was situated in the car in such a way that his uh, legs actually extended beyond the imaginary axis of the front wheels. So the first thing that ran into something to absorb energy after the nose of the car was gone were the driver's feet. As a result of this analysis, the designers reinforced the car's nose cones to withstand an incredible 40 tons impact force. And crippling injuries to the feet and ankles practically disappeared overnight. But unfortunately, in crash safety, the solution of one problem just creates another for the engineers. And this new strong nose cone would become a devastating weapon in a car-to-car -car impact. If you sort of throw a dart through a piece of paper, the energy just stays in the dart, and the dart keeps on going at the same speed. So you're not actually managing the energy, you're just one structure's moving through another structure. 2001 was a difficult year for Alex Zanardi. He'd returned to the US kart series after a disappointing spell in Formula One. But the Lautzitz Ring 500 race in Germany, Alex was back on form and giving it his all. We were near the end of the race, about 13 laps or so to the end of the race, and um, Zanardi was leading, and he had a pit for fuel. I was watching in the medical center, the TV monitor there, and saw Alex uh, leave the pits and get onto the pit access road, and he, in his uh, 
hard charging style that he always has, he was really going too fast. He lost control on the pit access road, uh, went backwards across the racetrack, and much to my horror, uh, was hit broadside by Alex Tagliani's car. This is a reconstruction of what viewers witnessed on their TV screens. The collision was unavoidable. When cars drive at speeds of 230 kilometers an hour, they travel a whole car length in just 10 thousandths of a second, and in one complete second, the length of a football pitch. Driving at such speed, Tagliani would have seen Zanardi stationed in the road just over a second before impact. I thought, personally, uh, after seeing so many crashes, that we were going to be dealing with a double fatality. And, of course, my heart sank. Uh, I was uh, petrified, as a matter of fact. We pulled up to the scene. I got out of the truck and started running up the track to the the car, and as I got close, I started slipping, and it was a banked track. Slipped and fell on my knees and kind of slid up to the car, when I, and that was when I saw he didn't have any legs. Terry called me on our private radio channel, and uh, he said, uh, this is bad. He said, it's really bad. He said, both legs are gone. And I said, what do you mean gone? He said, they're gone. And I said, is there anything that we can salvage anything we can save. He said, no, they're destroyed. And he said, he, he, he's dying. I've done a lot of, of road trauma in the past, and that kind of injury in a, in a public setting is, is almost a certain fatality. In the thighs, the veins are huge. Just think, take five liters and put it in a bucket and then put a hole about the size of a quarter in, in it in two places and see how long it takes to drain. And that, that's basically what we were dealing with. Alex was uh, white as a ghost, uh, looked like a ghost. He was unconscious, uh, his uh, head, eyes had rolled back in his head. Uh, he had no response at all. Zanardi was losing blood rapidly. Dr. Olvi fed three IVs into his body to manage this blood loss. This kept him alive, but the diluted blood lacked the vital oxygen needed to feed his brain. I told him to uh, get him in the helicopter and, and head for Berlin. I went back inside uh, with Terry to uh, look at Tagliani because he had been in the same crash and we were sure that he probably had some injuries. So we examined him quickly, determined there was nothing, nothing life-threatening uh, with Tag, brought him out on a stretcher to go in a second helicopter, realized that the first helicopter with Alex was still there. And uh, I, I just, I, I panicked, I, I didn't panic, I just, I'm very angry, and I went over to the helicopter and I said, you know, the only German words I knew, I grabbed the pilot, I pulled him down out of the helicopter and I pointed to the sky, I said, Schnell, Schnell. By the time Zanardi reached hospital, he had lost over 72% of his blood volume and had, at the most, four minutes left to live. Once stabilized, the doctors now turn their attention to the brain damage this massive blood loss may have caused and place Zanardi into an induced coma. The induced coma was, uh, is a method of uh, brain protection. If you can keep the brain quiet um, in the initial stages of a concussion, whether it's a, a moderate or severe concussion or a, a really bad head injury, uh, it's beneficial and allows the, uh, the brain cells to kind of regroup and begin the, uh, the healing process. After three days, Zanardi was reanimated. Daniela, uh, Alex's wife, wanted to be the first one in there when he started to wake up. And uh, we were just amazed and, and uh, so pleased that because when he did wake up, uh, he recognized uh, Daniela and, and he told her at that time uh, that uh, he'd be okay as long as he had her and his son. Nowadays, it's hoped that improvements in design have almost eradicated the T-bone danger. When you have this T-bone accident, the survival cell is now so strong that it will resist penetration from the bullet car. And what that means is it will tolerate loads in excess of sort of 20 tonnes. Um, and it will remain absolutely intact and all the energy is dissipated into the car that impacted. The nose cones fitted to the current Formula 1 cars are a very, very efficient energy absorber, which means if a Formula 1 car hits a brick wall at, say, 40 miles an hour, 
it, the nose cone will absorb all of that energy with no damage to the wall and no damage to the rest of the vehicle. Alex is back uh, being competitive old Alex and uh, I think six months after his injury uh, he was in a hand control go-kart. In a world where crashing is an inevitable part of racing, the determination amongst injured drivers to return to the racetrack is immense. But few have shown such incredible willpower as Grand Prix motorbike rider Mick Doohan. Over the course of his astounding racing career, Mick Doohan won the 500cc World Championship a record-breaking five consecutive times. However, he's also had over 100 crashes. I would tell myself at the beginning of the season that I'm probably going to crash twice, you know, and, uh, you know, I just hope that I can... I won't hurt myself in those. A World Championship bike weighs 145 kilos and has 240 horsepower. From standing still, it can travel to 160 kilometers an hour and back to north in just 16 seconds. And all that power is controlled by the rider's body weight. At close to 200 mile an hour or 320 kilometers, which we're exceeding uh, uh, these days, the thing only wants to go straight. So unless you put a lot of physical energy into it, it's not going to go anywhere but straight. In every lap, the riders spend just 11 seconds seated. The rest of the time, they're cool. I'm just a huge amount of admiration for motorcycle racers. Yeah, they are doing all sorts of things with the, with the bike, which you know, common man couldn't even contemplate. The corners are the most gruelling part of the race. As the bike pitches over to around 50 degrees, the footprint of the tyre on the road changes, lessening the grip with the surface. With so much horsepower going through the rear wheel, the motorcycle being so light, generally the front, if you rode it just by using your handlebars, the front, uh, the front tyre would actually slide away and you'd crash. So you're not riding the, the bike with your hands anymore, you're actually throwing it with your body weight and through your footrest. In doing this, the rider has lowered the centre of gravity on the bike. Now this is where the cornering gets really precarious. They spin the rear wheel up to control the slip and the slide of the machine in its trajectory through the corner. In the middle of the corner, the rider now opens the throttle, putting power into the back wheel. This should accelerate them out of the turn, but just one tiny error and they're in a high side situation. If in sliding the, the tyre suddenly bites, suddenly finds grip, it will kick the machine and that's, you know, that's a high side. Whilst high sides are not the most common form of crash, they are the most deadly. I have seen crashes where realistically at 30 mile an hour on a high side on acceleration coming out of a corner might leap someone 30 30 feet in distance and 10 feet in the air and coming down is a very horrendous situation. It's definitely like, not like riding down to the, to the local grocery store to get a, uh, get a bottle of milk to take home to have some coffee with. In 1992, Mick Doohan was on course to win his first ever World Championship title. In fact, journalists were already speculating that, with six races left, Doohan just needed to win two of them to take the title. But then, a high side at Assen in Holland changed everything. Long story short, I crashed, the bike landed on top of me. I'm sliding down the road at about 110 mile an hour with the bike on top of me. I tried to spin myself out from underneath it because it's starting to get a little bit warm, not the bike on top of me, but the friction running down the road. I tried to spin myself out from underneath it. Everything spun except for my, my leg, of course, and I, I, I broke my leg. Duan had sustained fractures at the base of his right tibia and fibula. It wasn't what, in medical terms, I'd consider a, a, a big injury. You know? It was just a, a broken leg. <laughs> Mick was ferried to the paddock's mobile clinic, where he was examined by the championship medic, Dr Costa. 
la caduta io avevo ricomposto in uno After the fall, I put la mix leg in a cast and it was healing very well and would have healed completely without an operation. So I proposed that instead of surgery, Mick rest and return to the World Championship for the second last race, hoping that his leg would be strong enough to win. Dr. Costa's advice meant eight weeks away from the championship, but Mick knew that with surgery, he'd be back on the track twice as fast. He was taken off to hospital that afternoon, and I think by the next day, people were talking about him coming back in a month or, you know, and he had such a big points lead that he would be able to come back, and even if he wasn't fully fit when he came back, he'd be able to get up to speed, and nobody had any doubt that he'd come back and win the title. But what was a routine operation brought terrible complications. Mick's leg muscles swelled up and cut off the blood flow. He was rushed back into surgery at once. The legs was dying, basically, I and mean, it was actually dying. I mean, Mick said it smelt like a bad butcher's shop. I'm sitting in a foreign hospital. I don't understand the language. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting much communication from the, the, the staff, let alone the doctors. He was in con constant contact with Dr Costa, who by then was back in Italy. And when the doctors in Holland said, well, if, if, it, if we don't sort this out within the next 24 hours, we're going to have to amputate it, Mick obviously got a pretty concern then. There were some serious complications. I got told of an airplane and flew to Holland. I practically kidnapped Mick from the hospital and I brought him to Italy. Strange as it may seem, the riders, they're all so keen to get back. You know, they're all desperately keen. All they want to do is get back. That they're quite happy to kind of undergo fairly extreme treatments to get them back on the track. And, and I, but I think what Mick went through was probably more extreme than what anybody's done. I just put a total 100% trust into Dr. Costa, really, and uh, I knew that I wanted to get back. There was only one way we were going to achieve that. In an intensive operation not for the feeble-minded, Mick's legs were sewn together. It's meno incredibile di quella che può che si può pensare. It's not as incredible as one would think. I just took all the gangrene parts of the dying leg and attached them to large portions of tissue from the living leg. With the dying leg in contact with the living leg, the goodness could be shared. Made life fairly interesting for 16 days, as you could imagine. And, but, um, but, you know, it was something we had to do. And uh, it, you know. Would I do it again? I don't know, <laughs> I did it then. <laughs> After that long operation, I consoled me. He didn't ask me how the operation went. He didn't ask me what had happened. He only said, I want to race and conquer the World Championship. When he came back to racing at Brazil with two or three races left, he still couldn't walk, he was on crutches. And I mean, he was green, you know, his face was green. He was that kind of poorly. Mick was back on the track within six weeks. It was an incredible sign of his determination, but this level of commitment would come at a price. I felt that fate wasn't fair to Mick Duan. It wasn't fair to be humiliated like that, considering all the risks he took and all the strength that he showed in trying to chase his dream. I missed the World Championship by four points, which was a bit of a, a you know, looking back on it, I was very disappointed, but also looking back on it, I was it was also probably a godsend as well because uh, had, I, had I won the championship, I probably would have stopped. Instead, Mick was determined to recover and held his sights on the world championship. In what would become a phenomenal comeback, Mick had to reinvent the way he rode a motorcycle. I'd lost the use of my foot, but I needed a rear brake, so I started riding and taking my thumb off to see, to see actually how much I'm using the thing. I wasn't using it that much, so for the next race we'd modified and we put a rear, a, a thumb activated lever. And the rest is history, basically. Bo boring, uh, boring short story. <laughs> Hello, 
Mick finally became the world champion in 1994, a title which he held for an incredible five consecutive years. For me, second, you've lost, you know, so second really didn't mean anything to me. It, uh, so winning was what it was all about and getting the most out of, out of myself and out of the motorcycle. But like so many riders before him, Mick was finally forced to retire after another devastating crash. You don't see people walk away from this sport healthy generally. I know two. Okay? Two in the last 20 years who've walked away with virtually no serious injury. All riders and drivers understand that the price of victory is based on the risks they're willing to take. There's only two types of oval drivers, those that, that have hit the wall and those who are about to. But for some, it's their death that becomes their legacy. Oh, no! Something went terribly wrong! In motorsport, freak injuries will always occur. Today, scientists are working on those which are preventable. To this day, head injuries are the, the number one cause of fatality in all series of motorsports. So the head is, is kind of loose uh, compared to the torso that's restrained in the car. The head and neck are allowed to kind of uh, freely move around in the event of a crash. Working to prevent disabling injuries, the engineers had found ways of better restraining the driver during impact. But this had created another problem. When you restrain the torso heavily, the head whips, there are very high centrifugal forces developed that pull on the head and will either break your neck or break the base of the skull. The reason for these high neck loads was eerily simple, and it was down to the duration the crash pulse lasts. Today, what we're trying to understand with race car crash data is to try to simulate on our sled the actual crash that the actual race car had because we can reproduce the acceleration now on the sled and we can find out what happened to that driver. This 50 km an hour velocity change sled test is comparable to a 200 km an hour impact. When cars crash at these speeds, the damage occurs in milliseconds. And on our camera, these fatal forces are over in just two frames. Contact at 260. OK. Go ahead and single frame it to full extension. 50 milliseconds. By analyzing the crash millisecond by millisecond, the engineers can calculate the precise duration of the impact and thus the forces on the head. That's it. 68 in. Now let's see him come out. Keep going. The shorter the duration, 70. the greater the risk to the driver. 135, he hits the bar on the far side. So that would be a full rebound sequence, about 135 milliseconds. With the crash duration faster than the blink of an eye, the acceleration of the head is so great that, for the crash pulse period, the pressure on the head is greater than the weight of this car enough to cause the fatal injury known as a basilar skull fracture. What happens in a race crash is the, is the torso swings forward and then the, tor then the shoulders are restrained and then the head continues to swing forward and there's enough load between the head and neck it actually breaks the base of the skull apart. The basilar skull fracture is not a new type of injury. It's been around for centuries in the form of judicial hanging, but in race cars, it was a string of deaths in the NASCAR stock car series that was to thrust it into the spotlight. In the summer of 2000, there were three drivers that were killed. Uh, Adam Petty from the famous Richard Kyle Petty line. He had a right frontal crash, basilar skull fracture. Tony Roper, Kenny Irwin, similar crashes, both died of basilar skull fractures. So that in the summer of 2000, it was, became clear that there was a problem in stock car racing with basilar skull fracture causing death. And then suddenly it sort of dawned on everybody, oh, that's what's happening. Everybody sort of began to realize that, and then they looked back and said, oh, this has been going on forever. It's a basic cause of death among race drivers. 
in what became a controversial crusade to get stock car drivers to wear head restraints, the engineers concluded that the three NASCAR fatalities would have been prevented had the drivers worn a recently invented restraint system known as the hands device. The basic idea of the, the Hans device is to restrain the head to, uh, so it directly resists the tendency for it to swing forward and that needs to be done by having loads that go rearward through the middle of the head and then those loads are transmitted down through the collar and the whole thing is restrained uh, with the body by the shoulder harness. So when the torso is restrained, the Hans device restrains the head right along with it. The Ford and General Motors engineers come here to Indianapolis and they plead with the NASCAR driver, start wearing the Hans device, it'll save your life. And they get almost deaf ears and they find drivers say, oh, I don't necessarily believe that basal skull fracture stuff, who ever heard of that stuff? You know, and here's some scientist, who is this Dr. Robert Hubbard from Michigan State? You know, here's some, here's some egghead from some Yankee University, you know, coming down here telling us how to do things. And Earnhardt was pretty much the, the ringleader against it. Uh, he re once referred to the Heinz device as, quote, that damn noose. Dale Earnhardt was a seven times NASCAR champion and a legend to stock car fans across the United States. But he was a renegade when it came to safety and to many his opinions against the hands epitomized the skepticism of the NASCAR community. His common sense told him if you wore straps around your helmet and you got in a crash it was going to hang you. So he referred to the Hans as the noose because he thought it was going to kill him rather than save him. As soon as I realized that it was practical, that it would work, at that instant in time, I became a fanatic, quietly resolved to continue working on this thing until it was used commonly. Despite the scientific evidence the engineers now provided, Earnhardt defied any changes in safety. He sat right here in Indianapolis the August before he died in February, and he looked me in the eye, and with a lot of people present, he said, he said, I'm comfortable the way I've got my stuff rigged. And he said, and I have not pulled my brain stem loose, and I've hit the wall many times. I have not pulled my brain stem loose, exactly the words, and I looked him back in the eye, and my thought was, yet. The Daytona 500 is NASCAR's legendary race and Dale Earnhardt has won them many times. But as the cars turned to the final bend on February the 18th, 2001, Earnhardt was third, his teammate Michael Waltrip in second, and his son, Dale Earnhardt Jr., leading. Earnhardt's job was to block the closest challengers, namely Sterling Marling and Rusty Wallace. So here comes Rusty Wallace flying up the middle, totally legal move, uh, totally legitimate, flying up right behind Earnhardt. Well, when he got up behind him, right before the entrance to turn four, the, the aerodynamic effect was to, Rusty's car ran up behind, took the, took the downforce off the rear of Earnhardt's car. This reconstruction of the accident shows Earnhardt's car starting to fishtail as its back end loses grip with the road. At this point, Sterling Marling makes his move. Earnhardt blocks and loses control. Oh, something went terribly wrong. This is undoubtedly one of the toughest announcements that I've ever personally had to make. Uh, but after the accident and turn four at the end of the Daytona 500, uh, we've lost Dale Earnhardt. There is still debate about exactly what went on inside the car, but what is certain is that the first impact from number 36 veered Earnhardt's car into a deadly trajectory angle with the wall. Racing drivers call this the one o'clock hit because it stops the car immediately. Well, the Earnhardt crash is a complicated crash because it was a double hit. Uh, he was hit on the side and then he hit the wall. Uh, <clears throat> and the direction uh, of the impact with the wall was such that his head went off to the right and missed the steering wheel. 
because Dale's uh, body wasn't well restrained in the in the in the car, it, it developed a a larger velocity difference between his torso and the chassis, so that when the restraint system finally did hold his body, then it was more violent, and of course his head was unrestrained, and it caused a more violent swinging forward, and he had a basilar skull fracture from this uh, restrained torso, unrestrained head. When it happens to Superman, you know, that, that's the way that we viewed Dale in this sport. He was our Superman, and uh, if it can happen to him, sure, it can happen to anybody here. So we had to kind of, at that point in time, maybe uh, take the bull by the horns and say, hey, we, this is a wake-up call, that something we should have been looking at before now, that we were a little slow in reacting. But uh, I think that we've moved at a very rapid rate since that point in time. Six months after Earnhardt's death, the hands device was made compulsory in all NASCAR races. If we would have just sat still and the safety measures wouldn't have gotten better uh, from that point, uh, then it would have been even more tragic. But we haven't. We've moved on, and I think that they'll be very proud of what he could see with this sport right now. We tested the hands device just to see what it would take to destroy it, and the results were startling. After holding the equivalent of an incredible 160 G for over 500 times the crash pulse period, the device finally gave up. Conceptually, there is no limit to the acceleration levels that the Hans device will help restrain, will restrain the guy's head in a crash. The Hans performance in real race car accidents is startling as well. It went head on into the wall at about 210 miles an hour. And so, I mean, literally, I never lifted the throttle trace, just went like straight down. And... At a record impact force of 139 G, Richie Hearn's crash is the accelerometer's highest ever recorded impact. The tub crushed, he broke his foot. No head or neck injuries. I didn't have a headache, I didn't, have, I didn't black out, I didn't, nothing. I mean, I didn't have a mark, I didn't have a mark on me except for my foot. Rich's survival is true testament to the safety devices now implemented in all race cars and a triumph for the scientists and medics who have dedicated the work to protect drivers over the last three decades. Once you start collecting crash data in racing like this, you have to keep doing it. It's not the kind of thing that, well, we've learned everything we can learn about it, we can stop doing it. I think it's now become very obvious to the sanctioning bodies that it's something they're going to be doing for the rest of their active life. When you have a, a, a Jimmy Clark or an Artan Senna or, a, or Dale Earnhardt die, and it, it, it really gets through that, that emotional barrier, I guess, we are all carrying around with us. And we think, God, you know, why didn't I see that before? We know we need to do something, and something happens. And, and then we go on to the next plateau. But we're in, the, we're in the next denial stage now. We just haven't figured out quite where our next vulnerability is, but it's there. 